Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are exalted. You are high above all things. Oh God, you are glorious. You're magnificent, awesome, beyond what we can imagine. You are holy. You are righteous. You are perfect in all your attributes. And yet you have adopted us to be your beloved children. We've been seated in the heavenly places in Christ. All of our sin has been forgiven and we have been clothed in the righteousness of Christ. You resurrected us from spiritual death to spiritual life in You. We deserved eternal separation from You and never-ending torment, God. There is nothing in us to merit Your kindness and Your love. But Father, You had compassion on us while we were yet sinners in rebellion to You. And we are eternally grateful for Your grace and Your mercy that You've poured out on us. Thank You. Thank you for your abundant compassion towards us when we were so unworthy. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would speak to us from your word. Overwhelm us with Christ's compassion for the unworthy. Speak to us so that we can be your channels of that compassion. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. Are you worthy of Christ's care? Do you ever wonder why? Why would Christ want to help me? Why would Christ want to minister to me? Do you ever wonder that? In our humanness, it's so easy to feel unworthy, to feel completely undeserving of Christ's care and and Christ's concern. Because we are unworthy. We are broken. We are needy. We have nothing that merits Christ's intervention in our lives. Not at all. And that's exactly the kind of people that Christ ministered to. If you're not there already, please turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 17. And we will see in this passage that with compassion and power, Christ heals the unworthy. We're working our way through the book of Matthew when we come here to the beginning of chapter 8. And in Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 17, Christ, I mean, Matthew selects three particular miracles that reveal a very unlikely and unanticipated focus of Christ's ministry. We'll look at three miracles today. And these three miracles show that Christ focused on the unworthy. Christ focused on the unfit. Christ focused on the completely undeserving. In each of these miracles, Christ healed someone who was from the perspective of the Pharisees and of the Jews was at the lowest level of society. First, we'll see that Christ healed a a leper. And then secondly, we'll see that Christ healed a despised Gentile. And third, we'll we'll see that Christ healed a sick woman. And the whole point, if you've been with us, you know the whole point of Matthew's gospel is to show that Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah that we must fully follow. That's why Matthew wrote this book. That's why the Spirit of God inspired him to write this. And we just finished going through the Sermon on the Mountain, Matthew chapter 5 through 7 where Christ clearly taught as only the Messiah could teach. He he taught with profound authority. We saw that at the end of that that sermon. Matthew says he had an authority that was unlike anyone else's authority as he preached and as he taught. Now, a first century Jew could ask, well, who is saying these things? By, By whose authority does he speak? Why should we believe what he is saying in these outlandish claims? Why should we obey this? Because our Lord did not just make great claims. He did not just teach with authority. He had the power to heal disease. He had the power to cast out demons. He had the power to forgive sins. Yes, Christ the Messiah preached powerful words. We've just seen that in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. But now we will see that Christ the Messiah performed powerful works. He preached powerful words, but he performed powerful works. And although there were other prophets and men of God that were sent from him who did miracles, we'll see miracles at other places in your Bible, men like Moses and Elijah and Elisha and and the apostles in the book of Acts, no one, no one ever healed like Christ did in his magnitude and in his magnificence. Completely different spectrum. We will see Christ do that in Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 to 17. In particular, we need to notice who it is that he focuses his ministry on. 
we will see that with compassion and power, Christ heals the unworthy. First, we will see that Christ heals the unclean, heals a leper. Secondly, we'll see that Christ heals the outsider, a Gentile centurion slave. And then we'll see that Christ heals the insignificant, a sick woman. First of all, Christ heals the unclean in verses 1 through 4. It says there in Matthew chapter 8, verse 1, when Jesus came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. We've been with Christ on that mountain for the last year as we've gone through the, the Sermon on the Mount. Christ has just preached powerful words from the Sermon on the Mount. And now he will perform powerful works. There was a multitude, many thousands and thousands of people that had listened to him, that had heard him preach the Sermon on the Mount. And now they continue to follow him down that mountain. And they will see him perform mighty works. Verse 2, it says, in Matthew 8, 2, it says, And a leper came to him and bowed down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Leprosy was the most feared disease of ancient time, more than any other. Far more than a mere skin disorder, leprosy bacteria, it numbed all sensation of, of feeling. Leprosy destroyed the flesh, the bones and the organs, even the vocal cords, until the suffering patient began to, to lose extremities that, that slowly rotted away or, or that were damaged because they couldn't feel them. In Numbers chapter 12, verse 12, Miriam, Moses' sister, was struck with leprosy, and Aaron described her as becoming, quote, as one dead on whom the flesh is half eaten away. According to Leviticus 13, lepers, they had to shout constantly when they were in public, unclean, unclean. Everywhere they went to warn people, they had to live a life that was completely separate from all of society. It was, a, it was a living death. And although the physical su suffering was terrible, there was also a, a great distressing social stigma because a Jew, the, the most devastating aspect of leprosy was not the physical part of it, is that they were religiously defiled. They were considered to be unclean. That is, they were cut off from God. They couldn't go to the temple. They couldn't participate in any of the sacrificial system. And Luke's account, Luke writes account of this same miracle. And in Luke's account, Luke, the doctor, gives a, a doctor's clinical perspective when he says this man was full of leprosy. This wasn't a beginning of this disease. He was far along. This was the advanced stages of the disease. And everything about this suffering man would have been absolutely revolting if you would have been there and witnessed it. But as you read in the text, it says that this man came confidently. He came confidently. He's heard of this miracle-working rabbi. He's probably heard that he is healing people. And this man is so desperate that he's lost all shame. He's lost all sense of social stigma and what was proper. He just boldly comes to Christ. And if you had been there, there's a great crowd, but you would have seen the crowd begin to part as if an unseen hand is, is pulling the people back in horror. You would have turned away in disgust as did everyone else in the crowd, everyone but Christ. This man came boldly, but he also came reverently. Matthew records here, the man bowed down before Christ. He is worshiping Christ. He knows who this is. He's prostrating himself before Christ in an act of humble worship. He's broken. He's helpless. He's desperate. And he's driven to worship the Lord. Look at the end of verse 2. It says, what does he say? He, he comes to Christ. He bows before him. And then he says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He calls him Lord, and this is far more than just a, a simple greeting like, Sir, he knew he was in the presence of God. Why else would he have fallen down to worship him? Why else would he say that Christ could heal him? And notice the word he uses here. He doesn't say, You can heal me. He says, You can cleanse me. It's a different word. Because that was the issue with leprosy. Because of his leprosy, this man was not just physically sick. This man was unclean. He was unclean. He knew that only God could cleanse him. So he comes confidently to Christ, boldly. He comes reverently. But we also see that this man comes with a, a great humility. 
Great humility. He is confident that Jesus can cleanse him. He says, Lord, if you're willing, he knew that Jesus could. If you're willing, he knew he could. But the only question was, is Jesus willing or not? You can make me clean, but is he willing? He doesn't presume. He doesn't demand. He just throws himself on the grace and the mercy of Christ. So he comes boldly to Christ, reverently, worshipfully, humbly. And then the crowd is silent. Because remember, there are, there are thousands of people surrounding them. This is a very public event. What would Christ do? What would Christ say? And what Christ does is absolutely shocking. Look at verse 3. Jesus did the unthinkable. He stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing. Be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. He intentionally touched this man-shaped mass of decaying flesh. And this word touch doesn't just mean to lightly touch. It means to grab hold of someone very intensely. And no one there could have fathomed, what is he doing? Why is he grabbing hold of? Why is Christ touching this leper? No doubt it had been years since this leper had felt human touch, even from his own family. No one touched lepers. No one. No one but Christ. And yet Christ reaches out and touches this man with grace and mercy. And he is not made unclean because he's Christ. He's God. He's going to make this man clean. But there is more than a touch. What does Christ say? He says, amazing words, I am willing to be cleansed. Beloved, in this passage, we see there's a difference between Christ's sovereign power and Christ's sovereign will. And both of those must be present when it comes to healing. Both of those are crucial. Christ was not only able to heal this leper, but also it says he was willing sovereignly to do that. And so he stretches out his hand. He says, I'm willing to be cleansed. And what happens? Immediately, immediately and completely, his leprosy was cleansed. The leper was immediately cleansed completely of his dreaded disease. If his face had been defigured and destroyed, if his bloody limbs had worn off, if his, if his throat had been scarred, if his internal organs had been damaged, if his fingers and toes had curled up into claws and even fallen off, if his eyes were sunken and even gone, all of that was instantly and completely restored. And if you had been there, if you had witnessed this, you'd have been absolutely astounded. It would have caught your breath to see a, a miraculous just transformation as this horribly looking piece of rotting flesh morphs right before your eyes into a healthy, whole man right before your eyes. Absolutely stunning. And it was a public. Everyone had seen what had happened. So what does Christ say? What now? Look at verse 4. And Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one. Are you serious? How is he going to do that? But go, show yourself to the priests and present the offering that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Christ didn't want this man to spread the word of this miracle without a very clear proclamation of the gospel because Christ has just taught. And so everyone that saw this, they had just heard Christ's message and now they see the miracle. Christ wanted those things to be experienced together for anyone that heard about this miracle. He also didn't want the crowds, the Jewish crowds to think, wow, we can use this power to, to overcome for overcome the Romans. So he says to the healed leper, don't tell anyone about this. Now Mark's account tells us he wasn't able to do that. It says that he told everyone about it so that Christ even had to go out into the wilderness because everyone became aware of this miracle. He couldn't be in the cities because so many people came after him because they heard about this miracle. But there was one place that this man was supposed to go and to tell what had happened. Look at the end of verse 4. It says, but go, show yourself to the priest and present the offering that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Beloved, we need to make sure and read our Bibles. We need to make sure and read all our Bibles, even the, the smaller things that seem kind of insignificant. No, this man is to make the journey. It's about 60 to 70 miles by foot, which shows that when, this, when Christ heals, there's no rehab necessary. He doesn't have to kind of recover from this. No, he is completely well. He's going to make a journey of 60 to 70 miles to walk down to Jerusalem. 
But why was he to do that? Why was he to go to Jerusalem and go to the temple? Well, first Christ says, Moses commanded that. We've just seen in the Sermon on the Mount that Christ said, I didn't came to, to nullify the law or abolish the law. Christ said, I came to fulfill it. So Christ is, is having this man fulfill the law and going down and do what he's supposed to do, make a, a sacrifice. And there's a, the whole, there's a whole protocol that is supposed to go through. Someone that had been healed from leprosy, he was supposed to, to do that. But also, don't miss the little phrase at the end of the verse. What does it say? As a testimony to who? Them. Who's the them? The priests. The priest that would have been in the temple. Christ was sending a special message to the priests in Jerusalem. To the very men who what? These men weren't his friends. These men were his outright enemies. These are the men that was against Christ. John's gospel tells us that Christ has already cleaned out the temple once. He's already been there. They know who this Jesus is. And now this man is coming and he will confirm, then they will, they will have to confirm by their words, by their actions. These men who are Christ's enemies will have to confirm, yes, you have been healed, obviously. You no longer have leprosy. In Luke chapter 17, Christ told the, the ten lepers there to go down to the temple so they could do the same things. Who knows how many healed lepers that Christ sent down to Jerusalem again and again and again. No doubt, hundreds of them, because it says he healed so many people. Every time there's leper, he would have said this very same thing. Go down to Jerusalem, go to the temple, talk to the priests, and they had to proclaim over, Christ, over the healed lepers that yes, you were healed. It was an undeniable testimony to the priest that Jesus was the promised Messiah because of what he had done. So what are the implications from this first miracle that we see? Well, I think the first implication is we need to trust God's power and God's sovereignty to heal. We need to trust God's power and His sovereignty to heal. Beloved, we believe, we believe in God's power to heal today. We believe that clearly. Now, we don't believe that the Bible teaches the gift of healing that the apostles and others had in the first century for today. We don't believe that spiritual gift is for today. That sign gift of healing was given uniquely to verify the authority of the apostles in the first century as they wrote the New Testament, as they established the first century church. But we strongly believe that God is able to heal today. As a church, we often pray with great faith and great hope for His healing of those with serious sickness. But we echo the leper's words here when He said, Lord, if you are willing, you can. And that's, that is true faith. Complete confidence in God's power, but Humble submission to His sovereign will. No, no presumption, no prideful demands. You may have heard the, the statement, well, if you just had enough faith, you would be healed. Nothing could be further from the truth. That is not true. That is not from the Bible. That leper had great faith. He had the kind of faith that we must have. He had confident faith. He had trust that God is able to heal. God is powerful, and God can heal today. But also, just as important, there is a second aspect to his faith. And what faith, and what was that? He had a humble and confident trust in God's sovereign will. That's a great faith. That's a true faith. Beloved, a... A lack of healing doesn't reveal a lack of faith. It doesn't. A lack of healing could reveal a profound God-glorifying faith. Because God-glorifying faith trusts that Christ, who is able to heal, also knows when to heal. And we see that in the words of this leper. The Lord knows. He knows what will give Him the greatest glory. He knows what will bring us the most good. And so our call is to trust Him. Will we trust Him and depend on Him in faith? I think there's a second implication from this first miracle, and that is consider Christ's compassion. Consider Christ's compassion. Beloved, why did Christ touch this man? 
Why? Why does he do the unthinkable? No one, no one would have touched this man. And he still has the leprosy. He doesn't touch him after he healed him. No, he touches him before he healed him. It was a part of that healing process. But why does he do that? Why does he heal this man? Mark's account of this very same miracle tells us the why. Mark 1.41 says, here it is, moved with compassion compassion. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing be cleansed. Christ was filled with compassion. Christ's ministry wasn't a, a heartless, sterile exercise. Crank him through. Get him healed. Come on, let's go. Let's get the line going. Not at all. Every miracle was an expression of his compassion, his tender heart toward the suffering and the struggling. His heart was moved with compassion. Beloved, Christ had a sincere and, and earnest love for this man. Our Savior, He is not oblivious to people's suffering. He's not oblivious to, to your suffering. He truly cares about, about your suffering, your struggle. There's a number of people at our church, in our body, that are going through seasons in different ways of, of great suffering, great struggle, and, and Christ is compassionate, compassionate. Psalm 116.5 says, Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is compassionate. Beloved, you have a compassionate God. Are you, are you overwhelmed by Christ's compassion for you? He is filled with compassion. He's filled with compassion, not just for first century lepers. No, He's filled with compassion for, for spiritual lepers in the 21st century. And that's all of us. Every one of us. Because if you don't see him as compassionate, you will not run to him like the leper did. Why did he run to him? Because he knew, he sensed, he was aware of Christ's compassion. And if you don't have that same sense of Christ's compassion, you will not run to him like the leper did. Do you praise God for Christ's compassion on you? But we should be overwhelmed with his compassion and his tender love. I think it's another aspect of that is, is do you have his compassion for others? Do you have that compassion? Are you a conduit, not a cul-de-sac, of his compassion? It's very easy to become hardened to the suffering of those who reject Christ, particularly it's if it's because of their sinful choices. And, and though we can't condone sin, may we have Christ's tender heart to those that are caught in the ravages of sin, which is all of us. That's all where all of us were. May we be eternally grateful. Beloved, for Christ's compassion for us. And then, may that cause us to, to pour out His compassion on others. So we see this first miracle. Christ heals the unclean. Why? Because the whole point of this passage is with compassion and power, Christ heals the unworthy. Let's look secondly, Christ heals the outsider. Remember, Christ is coming down from that mountain. It's not a small mountain. It's, smaller than, it's way smaller than Mount Spokane. It's kind of more like a little hill. Christ is coming down that hill, and it's about a, a mile from where Christ preaches the Sermon on the Mount. He walks along until he gets to Capernaum. It's, it's just about a mile, a very short walk. And there's a multitude walking with him. And he's walking along. On that journey, he heals the leper. And as he continues walking, he comes into the city of Capernaum. But there's someone there to meet him. Look at verse 5 and 6 of Matthew chapter 8. And when Jesus entered Capernaum, he's just healed the leper. Remember, that's just happened. And when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, imploring him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. What was a centurion? Well, centurions, they were the backbone of the Roman army. Um, they would um, be over a group. They commanded a group of 100 soldiers. And I doubt if most of the Romans would have interacted very politely with Jewish peasants because that's what the, the Galileans were in Galilee. They wouldn't have. What, what conquering Roman would have called a Jew lord like this centurion does here? But there's something different about this centurion. Luke's account tells us that it was actually some Jewish people that came on behalf of this centurion because they appreciated him so much. They came and interceded to Christ on behalf of the centurion because the centurion felt so unworthy. In fact, this centurion, this very man, was responsible for building the synagogue there in uh, Capernaum. And so he was very highly respected by the Jewish people. 
What else do you notice that's very significant about the centurion? He has a care and concern for his servant. This isn't a family member. It's, it's a, for his servant, for his slave. And at that time, slaves are just considered property. Well, if you have a sick slave or he's tired, just get rid of him. Get another one. Buy another one. And yet he doesn't. There's compassion here. We don't know the nature of this servant's paralysis, whether he had polio or a brain disorder or a tumor, but he was paralyzed, and he was being tormented with great pain. And this centurion was very concerned um, for that. And so the compassionate master, he pleads with Christ, please, please, do something. Please, can you help my slave? Look at Matthew 8, 7 to 8. Jesus said to him, I will come. I will come and heal him. But then this in response is amazing. He said, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. Now you look at what Christ says. He says, I will come and heal him. You say, wait a minute, Jesus, don't you know? Don't you know that this man, he's a Gentile. And certainly his slave was a Gentile as well. This man represents the conquerors of your people. This is the last guy you should want to help. No, he's not on our side at all. And yet Christ is demonstrating his heart here. A heart that from the very beginning of his ministry intended that the good news of the gospel was for all the world, for every people. So Jesus says, I'll come. I'll come and heal him. But then the centurion's response is amazing. The centurion immediately responds and says, No, no, don't come to my home. I am unworthy for you to come to my home. Just speak and he'll be healed. There's, there's great humility. He asked Christ to speak the word and, and he had complete faith. He has trust that his servant boy would be healed. Look how he explains in verse 9. He says, For I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, Go. And he goes. Another, Come. And he comes. And to my slave, Do this. And he does it. The humility of this man is stunning. He knows that he has delegated authority from Rome. He understands the chain of command. And he has complete faith in Christ. He says, no, you don't need to come to my home because I know if you speak the word, my servant will be healed. Verse 10, and this is in Christ's humanity. What does it say? It says, when Jesus heard this, he marveled. He was amazed. He wondered. And he said to those who were following him, remember this is a public thing, truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. Why is that a stunning statement? He's talking about the Jewish people. Of all the Jewish people that I've been around, I've found no one that has this level of faith that this Gentile has. He, he seems to imply that if anyone should come to him in submissive faith, it should be the Jews. But here this Gentile is responding in amazing faith to what Christ is doing. Look at verse 11 to 12. I say to you that many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the outer darkness and that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, who are those that are going to come from east and west when he's talking about the, the coming kingdom? Well, it's, it's us. It's the Gentiles um, that had come to Christ in faith and repentance and uh, coming to the great heavenly feast. It's not talking about the, the Jews. The Jews are called the sons of the kingdom, and they prided themselves on being the rightful inheritors. They didn't care about the Gentiles. Some of the rabbis said, well, God only created Gentiles because he needed fodder for hell. He has no need for them. But Christ is clearly saying, no, that is not the heart of God. God has always had a heart for the Gentiles. He says when the kingdom comes, he says that they will be thrown out. Any person who doesn't have humble trust in Christ will be thrown into outer darkness, hell, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, eternal torment beyond imagination, beyond description. And any Jews, and there are many Jews that would have heard this, this would have been a, a rebuke, a brutal rebuke to them, the religious hierarchy. Now, yes, there will be Jews that will be gathered into the kingdom, certainly. He talks about some of them there. He talks about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're Jewish. There will be many Jews there. But he's saying there will be many Jews that are relying on the religious exteriors uh, that will not be there. And Christ will welcome in many Gentiles. Look in verse 13, and Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it shall be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. 
What a powerful miracle. Isn't it interesting that Christ doesn't say, it shall be done for you as you requested. Rather, he says, I'm going to do for you as you believed. Because Christ knows that this man has faith, true faith, belief in Christ. Faith was the issue. So we have another example of humble faith. And it says in the text, that servant was healed at that moment. Not when the Syrian gets home, not because Christ visited him, because there's no record that Christ visited him. It's at that very moment. The word of Christ healed the centurion's servant. So what are the implications for this second miracle when Christ heals the centurion's servant? Well, most all of us are in this category. Most all of us in this room are in this category. I don't know all of your ethnic background, but for most of us, we're Gentiles. Christ is making a statement by healing this Gentile centurion slave who is no doubt a Gentile as well. Psalm 67 verse 4 says, Let the nations be glad. Not just the Jewish nation. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you will judge the peoples with uprightness and guide the nations on the earth. Beloved, praise Him, praise God that He's always had a heart for the nations. Even from the beginning, His plan for the Jewish people wasn't so that they could just follow God and and God doesn't care about anyone else. No, they were to be a a light to the nations that through them that God would reach the nations. But they failed at that. God has always had a heart for the Gentiles. Praise God. Otherwise, most of us who are Gentiles would have no hope. And this is a precursor to the very end of the of book of Matthew, Matthew 28, the Great Commission, when after His resurrection, Christ commands His disciples to take the gospel where? Not just to the Jewish people, but to the ends of the earth, to the nations. Matthew 28, 19. He says, go therefore, this is after His resurrection, go therefore and make disciples of what? All the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Christ has a heart for the nation. We, we as Christians must have a heart for the nations. That's why we support missionaries who take the gospel and establish a church around the world where there's no gospel witness. We often put them in your bulletin so you can be praying for them as they're scattered in different places in Czech Republic, in Cambodia, in Israel, all over. They're taking the gospel to the nations. In Madeira, taking the gospel to the nations. That's why we pray that God would raise up from our midst some of you, that would be missionaries that we could send out for the eternal good of the nations. God has always had a heart for the nations. And so we see here in this second miracle that with compassion and power, Christ heals the unworthy. He heals the unclean. We saw that in the leper. Secondly, He heals the outsider. We saw that in the centurion's Gentile servant. And then finally, we see Christ heals the insignificant. Look at Matthew eight fourteen. When Jesus came into Peter's home, this is the Apostle Peter, who's been called to follow him. He's one of his disciples. When he came into Peter's home, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick in bed with a fever. Now, why would I say Christ heals the insignificant? Because at that time, this is what they would consider this woman. A common Jewish prayer that men prayed was, Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, for not making me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. Every day praying that prayer. So when Christ focuses His power on the sick woman, it shows that that no one is too insignificant for His ministry. He shows that that is not God's heart at all. At all. Luke, who is the physician, he gives a physician's uh, perspective on that when he says that this woman had a high fever. It's literally a a mega fever. It was not just a little fever. No, she had a mega. This was a, a deadly fever that she very easily could have died from. In verse 15, it says, And he touched her hand. We see that touch again. And the fever left her. And she got up and waited on him. No incantations. No fanfare. A touch and a word. He compassionately touches this woman's fever-ridden hand and raises her up. And she is immediately, she is completely healed. And then what does she do? Well, if you've had a bad fever... What do you do? You want to rest. You need some sleep to recover. Not her. Not at all. She jumps up and she's a serving whirlwind. You would have been overwhelmed with delight what Jesus just done. The woman that had just been on her deathbed minutes before is, is scurrying around and serving everyone that's there. Why? Because when Christ heals, Christ heals immediately and Christ heals completely. But there's more that day. There's more than just three miracles. Look at verse 16. When evening came, 
They brought to him many, many who were demon possessed. And he cast out the spirits with the word and he healed all who were ill. And so there's not just three miracles on this day. There were hundreds, if not thousands of miracles. I mean, many, many, many miracles. He's already healed. He's already preached the Sermon on the Mount. He, he did that this day. He healed the leper. He healed the centurion slave. He healed Peter's mother-in-law. And most of us say, wow, this has been a big day. No, that's just the beginning. Because they bring, the word has traveled, and they bring many people to him. And so that he has an evening that probably went late into the night that's absolutely filled with healing. Matthew says that Christ cast out many demons from people who were possessed. Now, if you're familiar with the Gospels, it's, it seems literally as if all hell breaks loose. Why? Because the unseen spiritual battle that's bubbled on the surface since Genesis 3, it's exploding with a fiendish fury. The serpent's head, Satan, it's about to be crushed. And so he and his minions are writhing and, and fighting against their coming destruction. It's going to happen very quickly. But all that Satan and his evil demons are doing, all they're doing is providing vivid platforms for Christ to display his exceeding great power over all spiritual realms. And, and then it says that the Lord healed all who were sick. In other words, anyone that showed up that was sick got healed. Didn't matter what you had. And if you lived at this time, any kind of serious medical condition, you would have been almost completely helpless. And actually, the medical helpers actually didn't help. They actually usually made it worse. I and mean, we have all kinds of things we can do. I mean, you can call your doctor. You can go visit your doctor. You can call, and literally within minutes, someone will come to you and help you and then take you to a hospital. They had nothing like that. It was hopeless. Sick people around Capernaum heard of this miracle-working rabbi, and they hobbled to him. They stumbled to him. If needed, their friends and relatives brought them to Christ, and he heals them. He heals all of them. Whatever disease someone had, it was healed. And it heals instantaneously. It was healed completely. So we, we've seen in the Sermon on the Mount, Christ, the Messiah, He preached powerful words. But then we see here in Matthew 8, 1 to 17, Christ, the promised Messiah, performed powerful, powerful works. He truly is the promised Messiah that you must fully follow. But then Matthew adds a little editorial in verse 17. Look at verse 17. Why? Why did he do these miracles? Well, Matthew tells you why, under the inspiration of the Spirit. He says, this was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. He quotes Isaiah 53. And he goes to that. Remember, Matthew is writing his gospel to show that Christ is the promised Messiah who fulfills the prophecies of the Old Testament. More than any other gospel writer, Christ quotes the Old Testament and said, Christ fulfilled, Christ fulfilled, Christ fulfilled. Now, what's the ultimate fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy? The ultimate fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy is that Christ's atonement on the cross will heal our sin problem, which separates us from God. So is there physical healing in Christ's death? What does this passage say? What does the Bible say? It says there is. It says there is. There is. But what does it mean? In the sense that when the Messiah comes and when he goes to the cross, he would deal with sin in, in such a way that the power of all sickness and disease would be carried away. The healing has been secured by the cross, but it will not be ultimately realized or fulfilled until heaven. Yes, there is healing in the atonement, but only insofar as it comes to us in the fullness of our salvation, in the coming redemption of our bodies when we're glorified in His eternal kingdom. Romans 8.23 tells us, and not only this, but we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption of sons, the redemption of our body. And the older you get, the more groaning you're going to have because your physical body is falling apart. But there is a promise that we see here in Christ's atonement. Someday, someday Christ will completely bear our sicknesses and diseases and infirmities away. And what Christ is doing here, what Christ is doing here is a taste of that. It's a preview of that. Do you think that these people that got healed never got sick again? 
Of course they did. Of course they did. They all eventually died, right? So we know that all these people got sick again. And yet what happens in this healing is Christ is showing His power, His power that ultimately comes through His death. So why all the miracles? Well, Christ's miracles proved that He was and is truly God. Because no mere human hand could do such things at this level of power and magnitude. Christ, the powerful Messiah, preached powerful words. Christ, the promised Messiah, performed powerful works. You can't miss it in this section of Scripture. So what are implications of this last section, these last miracles? As you read the miracles of Christ, an implication is that you should let Christ's miracles give you a, a longing for heaven. It gives you a greater longing for heaven. Revelation 21, 3-4 talks about that when it says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and He will dwell among them. What a glorious day that will be, won't it? And they shall be His people, and God Himself will be among them. Beloved, that's what you're heading to. And He, and I love this section, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Beloved, we need to let Christ's miracles that we read here put in us a greater longing for heaven. Pray in faith for healing. We do. We pray in faith for healing. We have a miracle working God, but even more than that, long for heaven where sin's curse will be completely reversed because of what Christ did on the cross. The miracles that we read of in the gospel, they point ahead to that future day when there will no longer be any sickness. Praise God. May every sickness, with, may every struggle with sickness and injury, may every struggle with that, may every struggle of a loved one with that, may it cause you to long for heaven all the more. Because why? With compassion and power, Christ heals the un- unworthy. Christ healed the unclean. Christ healed the outsider. Christ healed the insignificant. And that's all of us, isn't it? That's all of us. If you don't know Christ, this passage is a call to you to come to Christ, to believe that there's nothing in your life that can make you too bad for the gospel of Christ. It urges you to come to Christ like that leper did. Leper did. Come to Christ knowing that He can completely heal you. No matter what you've done, He can heal you and make you right with God. Not just for now, but forever. Beloved, are you compelled by the compassion of Christ for the unworthy? Are you compelled as you see Christ's compassion? Does that give you a heart for the unworthy? Because if you're overwhelmed with Christ's compassion for you, then that will cause you to be a channel of His compassion to others. In 1732, the Czech Moravian Church sent out two missionaries. And when they sent those two missionaries out in 1732, they knew, everyone knew, they would never come back. They weren't coming back. Why? Because they were sent to take Christ's compassion and love to a leper colony in the West Indies. Because even though 1,700 years had passed since the time of Christ, leprosy was still a, a terrible disease in the 18th century. There was no known cure at all. And it had destroyed, that terrible disease had destroyed the faces and the hands and the feet of many of the lepers that these missionaries ministered to. And the the lepers, they lived in complete isolation from society on that island. And it was was very costly, very costly for these two men to minister to the, the lepers because they knew that they could never return home to Moravia for fear of spreading that terrible disease. And yet, amazingly, the lepers were ungrateful. They didn't receive them. They didn't receive those missionaries well. They didn't accept their message of the gospel in spite of their great sacrifice. Why? Because they were outsiders. They were ignored. They were shunned. They were disregarded until God did something to soften the lepers' hearts. In His providence, the missionaries themselves got leprosy. And it was at that point that there was a radical change in their ministry. The lepers were overcome by God's compassion, and many of them opened their hearts to receive the good news of the cleansing gospel of Jesus Christ. And history doesn't even record those two Moravian missionaries' names. We don't even know their names, but God does. God does. 
These men had been so compelled by the compassion of Christ to the unworthy that they were willing to do whatever it took to be a conduit of His compassion to the unworthy. What about you? What about you? We were all spiritual lepers, right? Absolutely. Will you be overwhelmed by Christ's compassion for you in your unworthy state so that you can spread His compassion to others? Let's pray. Talk to the Lord. Thank Him for His grace and His compassion to you and drawing you to Himself. And then consider, who is it in your circle of influence that maybe you've categorized as unworthy and yet Jesus, Jesus hasn't? Who is it that God would have you to, to reach out with the love of Christ? Maybe it's someone that doesn't welcome that at all. Talk to the Lord. Father, we bow before you and we praise you and we thank you that no one has to try and become worthy so that we can deserve your ministry to us because none of us could. It would be impossible. And we thank you for this very stark account of you, Christ, reaching out to those who are completely unworthy. I pray that by your grace each of us will be overcome. Um, with the fact of your compassion to us. And then may that cause us to minister your compassion to others with joy and delight. In your precious name we pray. Amen.